Hey guys, I'm Matt Reisinger. And I'm Wade Paquin. And on the Build Show today, Wade and I are gonna give you three tips for building a better basement. Let's get going. Okay, y'all, basements. Wade builds a lot of them, I do not. <laughs> and what is under our feet is tip number one. Wade, talk to me about this. This is a detail I've seen you do before that I really like. What are we looking at? Yeah, thank you, Matt. So uh, we're standing on top of about an average of two inches of closed cell spray foam insulation. Okay, so closed cell foam under our feet and then concrete on top of that, mm -hmm. so that now I've got a fully insulated basement slab, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's right. Uh, but one important thing I found in this application over my experience doing this is a lot of uh, basements like this could be just regular dirt, regular gravel. Yep. Um, sometimes you see crushed stone. Mm -hmm. We prefer crushed stone because what we found is those voids in the stone, when the, when the liquid comes out of the gun and before the foam expands, penetrates into that stone, the voids in the stone. So it's like tentacles, they kind of get into the stone, uh, and then when it expands, it kind of holds it and anchors the foam down, right? Sometimes the foam might be here for a week or two before we get concrete on it. I found when we've applied this to gravel, the foam doesn't bond to it and actually can lift and kind of float around a little bit. Makes sense. So the stone seems to be a good kind of best practice uh, application from what I've found. I love it. And then I'm also noticing you've got kind of a bathtub effect where you sprayed that spray foam not only over the entire flat space, but up the walls. Talk to me about this detail back here, Wade. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, whether you're doing a four inch or six inch slab here, we've got two inches of foam coming up the wall down here in this zone. Mm -hmm. And then that's feathered as we come up. It's kind of tapered at the top. It tapers up. Yeah. So you may have about a half inch of foam here. Now, so now the reason for that is after the slab's done, we want to continue this envelope up to our rim board, top of wall, mud sill connection, right? So that's going to allow us to now spray foam this wall and come down and overlap this. I ah, love it. And then feather it back down kind of the reverse way. So mm -hmm. we end up with an average of two inches or whatever you're trying to achieve here in the wall. That's awesome. So your four inch concrete slab that's down here uh, is going to basically float on top of this. Mm -hmm. And we use rebar on that slab. Um, we, sometimes we use a uh, fiber mesh that gets put in with the mix at the, uh, at the plant. Okay. Or oftentimes uh, we'll use like a wire mesh. Gotcha. Because it's not structural at all. These walls are you're holding your structure above. You got a couple steel columns that are bringing loads to a footing. But all this slab down here is just holding people and couches and boxes, right? Yeah, that's usually most, most times that's the case. Sometimes uh, there might be a load bearing wall partition in the basement, mm -hmm. picking up a beam if there's not some point loads or something like that. And typically um, you'd have a depression there, what we call a haunch. Mm -hmm. So you get, you know, an average of maybe 12 to 18 inches of concrete wide and uh. deep in that spot that would maybe have some number five rebar in it uh, to support some of that load bearing on that one location. Got it. And then another, another thing I want to point out here is when Wade spray foams this wall, this will be after studs get framed. You know, this won't get framed in the basement walls won't get framed until the slab is in. Then they'll come up and look at when his spray foam contractor comes back, he'll be able to spray foam into those band joist areas, which is a very hard place to use traditional, let's say, bad or even blown insulation, right? Right. Wade? Right. Yeah. It's a critical connection, right? Mud seal to concrete. So we've air sealed our mud seal to the concrete. Uh, foundation. Now with the addition of the spray foam encapsulating that, we have a really good uh, protection barrier there. Love it. And then this is also going to be a vapor barrier. And speaking of vapor, let's talk water. You know, basements are a place that nobody wants water to come in. And yet on this basement, I notice you've got a couple of penetrations. Uh, talk to me about how you water seal these penetrations. Sure, before I get, I get on that, I should also mention that aside from being a vapor and moisture barrier here, this is also a good radon blocker, the spray oh, foam. Oh, smart. And another nice thing about it is that it's a monolithic application, right? That's right. Versus, uh, different types of foam boards and tapes, right? So um, really- Much easier. It's fast and, and clean, so. Um, but here with our concrete wall penetrations, right? We've got some couple holes here that are core drilled. Yep. I'm sure you've experienced this in maybe a frost wall, or I don't even know if you do frost walls we in Texas. We do sometimes. But any core drilling um, that's below grade, whether it's, you know, podge with hydraulic cement or a PVC sleeve and a conduit, they're hard to get completely waterproof, watertight, right? Yeah. Um, they may last for a while, but sometimes they fail. I came across this product here called Link Seal, 
um, which has been a game changer because it tells you, so if you have a one inch conduit, two inch, three inch, whatever size your conduit is, it will tell you what size hole you need to core drill for the link seal. So you can see here, we've got maybe an inch, inch and a quarter conduit, but we've got a much bigger hole. And that hole is designed to accommodate this specific link seal That's smart. product. So once and we- And then how does it work? So basically it's uh, like a rubber uh, gasket type of uh, system here that as you go around and crank these uh, bolts, it's applying the gasket pressure to the concrete core where it's been drilled out and against the conduit. So if you look in here, you can see that rubber really tight around not only the conduit, but the outside um, diameter of this core hole. And, and I think it's interesting that this wasn't a sleeve in the conduit, this was actually core drilled, so you're getting a much better, tighter, more round hole, right? Right, right. We could have sleeved this when we were placing the concrete in the wall and we knew our general location, but you know, we don't have the luxury then of using the link seal. Yeah. So later on, we know exactly where we want the conduit. We can come in with our core guy, set up his machine, core drill it out to the size we need for the link seal. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. I like that product. We'll put a link in the description for that, guys. Now the third tip, Wade, this is one that I don't think you even see anymore, <laughs> but as a Texas builder, one of the first things I notice when I walk into this basement is the ceiling uh, one by three. I think you call it strapping. Yeah, strapping or furring. Talk yeah. to me about that. It's a New England thing, right? Yeah. I don't know uh, when it started, but it was probably many decades ago. It's all I've ever seen since I was a kid on my dad's job site. That's crazy. To every job site I've ever visited, uh, ceiling strapping is just what we do. It's kind of like thing. plaster. You uh -huh. know, you probably use uh, sheetrock and do. compound. Yep. Here it's blue board and, and plaster veneer. So. Um, I guess it's just a little New England thing, but um, you know, I like it because it's doing a few things. It is allowing us to create a nice uh, chase way for the electrician to run his wire. So he yep. can just tack up and staple the wires right to the bottom of the joist yeah. and, and run. Um, the strapping is also giving the floor joist uh, some rigidity, right? So it's stabilizing the floor yeah, system. Right. If you're using, um, you know. Kind of like the old X bracing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, here we've got engineered eye joists, but if you're using standard lumber, like a two by 10, two by 12, KD, you know, something like that, where if, you're, if you have a two by 12 that's an inch and a 11 and a quarter, you know sometimes that comes 11 and three eighths or 11 and eighths. Yeah. And if you're applying your um, board, whether sheetrock or blue board, right to that, you could end up having those waves, yeah. right? So now you're having to shim that down if you're paying attention to what you're doing. Here, we can shim the, strapping down to create a nice level ceiling through you know string lines a jig Laser, lasers things yeah, there's whatever. different ways to do it yeah. um, so you know and it's quick and easy it's not super expensive the overall lumber for the whole project and it can get done very quickly by a good framing crew and right here wade is i think the the thing that really sells me on it i made a few mistakes on my house under construction with these types of areas right here mm -hmm. this is a uh, a steel beam that's supporting uh, or pardon me, a steel column that's supporting the steel beam. Mm -hmm. The beam's been packed out and then you've got joist hangers on there. And on top of that, you have a couple of uh, Fasten Master uh, Timberlock Pros on there, which easily any one of those things could bow our drywall if our drywall is hung right to those eye joists. But once you put that strapping on, all those things are kind of go away. You don't They're have hitting to in that three quarters. Right, you don't have to fuss around with it now because you've basically packed down the ceiling, so to speak, right? I love so it. So now you can just run right over that stuff and not have it be a problem. Super smart. So now, guys, when when your eyes up there, right in line with that eye or with that ceiling strapping, everything's nice and flat. Wade, great job on yeah. this house, man. Thanks, we man. Love it. Appreciate it, guys. If you don't know Wade Paquin, he's a builder in Rhode Island, but he's actually building now here on Block Island, which is about 12 miles off of the coast. It's a very difficult place to build a house. There's no hardware stores, home no centers, stores, yeah. no lumber yards out here on the island. Everything's got to come over on a boat, right? Yep. Including a lot of your labor. So he's been chronicling this entire build and we've got a once a month episode that's going to be coming out on buildshownetwork.com with episode one starting next month. In the description will be a link that you can sign up for our weekly newsletter so you can get informed. Do that but make sure you go follow Wade on Instagram in the meantime. Wade, great job over here, man. Yeah, thanks, man. It's always a pleasure having you. Three really good tips for a well-built basement from a seasoned basement builder like you, Wade. I appreciate it, man. Thank you.
Guys, if you're not currently a subscriber, hit that subscribe button. We've got new content here every Tuesday and every Friday. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show.